I'm David Keith, uh, Canada Research Chair of Energy and the Environment and Professor at the University of Calgary. David Keith, how important is carbon capture and storage to this whole challenge of reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Well, some answer is we don't really know, and we won't know for 30 years. But uh, I would say it's one of a handful of things we could do at very large scale now to take a really big bite out of carbon emissions. Huh. So there might be different things we could do 30 or 50 years in the future. Maybe solar will get very cheap after 2050. But in the near term, if you want to take a really big bite out of emissions, as we must do if we want to really deal with this problem, there's a pretty limited number of things you can really employ at huge scale worldwide. And it looks like wind power, nuclear power, and CCS is probably among the really big hammers we have to make a big bite out of humanity's carbon emissions. So the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Climate Change um, suggested that this could deal with somewhere between 15 and 55 percent of carbon emissions on the planet uh, up to 2100. There is enormous uncertainty about what technologies will be cheapest and what technologies will really allow us to do this incredible thing of eliminating carbon emissions as we must do over about 50 years in order to protect the climate and still have the energy services we want. And it could be that CCS will be a major, like 30, 50 percent chunk, or it could be that it will be a pretty minor chunk. We simply don't know. It's one of the things that seems important enough now that you can't easily ignore it. Another way to say it is the following. Humanity has and is likely to have for quite a long time a need for centralized power, gigawatt scale, large amounts of power we need for all sorts of pieces of human society. And right now, there are really only two ways to make power at that scale without CO2 emissions, and that's nuclear power and CCS. So do you see carbon capture and storage as a solution or as a means to an end? All these energy technologies are means to an end. Nobody wants energy. People want services like uh, mobility or illumination. And the purpose of energy is to provide those services. And what we have to do is provide those services with less carbon emissions. And we're going to do that by some combination of cutting the carbon intensity of primary energy or reducing the amount of energy we use in producing the services. So if not carbon capture and storage, then what? I'd say in, in many ways, carbon capture and storage and nuclear power are occupying a similar niche. They both provide very centralized sources of power that runs essentially all the time. And those are things that we have a great need of in our society. They both are kind of centralized, ugly technologies that have some environmental risk, including some long-term risk, with actually kind of a similar cost profile. So in, in a sense, I'd say those are quite similar. And they're quite dissimilar from, say, intermittent renewables, which can play a very important role in our energy system. But at least in the near term, intermittent renewables are not going to do away with the need for centralized power. So do you see pressure, world pressures, uh, depleting fossil fuels, those sorts of things? Are there forces that could conspire to uh, push us in a more distributed energy direction, in a direction where we don't rely mostly on the big single sources? Could be, but I more see the opposite. I think that there's been a reason why over the last uh, uh, hundred or actually several hundred years we moved to more centralization it has to do with economies of scale, with the fact that it's easier to regulate things when they're big in some respects. So I don't really believe in a small as beautiful future for the energy system because I think actually such a future might have a larger environmental impacts and be harder to regulate. Uh, uh, the, the assumption that we're automatically moving to a more distributed energy system I think is false. It's possible that we're moving there. But in fact, the momentum of the world is still going the other way. And it's by no means clear that a more distributed system is necessarily better on any dimension. Uh, and in particular, for those of us who care about environmental impacts, there's a fair amount of evidence, if you look around the world today, that actually distributed sources are harder. Uh, it's harder to control the environmental impacts of distributed sources than it is a big centralized source. At, with so solar and wind, and to pick two examples, you don't think 30% growth rates are, are something that could change that outlook? Well, I think if you have wind, wind is already pretty centralized. I think wind will only get more centralized. If wind is really going to play a big role, you're going to see you know, multi-gigawatt wind farms connected to demand centers by very long transmission lines. Because you want to put those wind uh, where the good winds are, and you want to be able to have it in an integrated big enough system that you can manage the variability of wind from one place to another. And similarly with sol solar, I think there's a real possibility that you'll get cheap solar PV, for example, although I don't think it'll happen soon. But I think there's essentially zero possibility you're going to do it on everybody's house. Because the fact is, the cost of accessing roofs is pretty expensive. There's no reason people want energy infrastructure built into every house. If solar gets cheap, you're going to do it in centralized places where you drive down the cost of labor to produce a lot of energy that people want at lower price.
So what do we need to do to uh, take carbon capture and storage past the demonstration support stage? Uh, well, I think in the near term, we need to find ways to get a, a, a limited number of projects actually built so we can kick the tire, so to speak, learn more about how what they really cost and what the risks really look like they were, at least in the short run. And I think the justification for doing that is exactly the same as the justification for the early investments we've made in solar and wind. So right now, the, the investments we're making in solar and wind are not um, economic with respect to, say, the current carbon prices. Uh, but I'm very much in favor of them because I think they buy down the, the, the future cost of those technologies or get us more uh, knowledge of what the potential is of those technologies. And in the same sense, I think it makes sense to make similar scale investments in CCS. And we're now in Canada have made several billion dollars of investments in various kinds of renewables. And I think it makes a lot of sense to make similar investments in CCS. And I'm glad to see it looks like we're beginning to do that. Yes. So how do we get uh, the incentives right to do something about climate change, whether it's CCS or anything else? I think we need to keep making the basic case to people that the climate risks are really large and that our, the science that describes those risks is more certain than the science around many other things on which we already regulate. So we regulate on all sorts of toxic chemicals where we have much less certainty than we do about climate. And I think the other thing we need to get around to people is that there are solutions that we can actually solve this problem. We can get to an energy system that emits essentially no carbon, not for free, but for a cost that's a few percent of GDP, a cost that will get lost in the economic growth over the next half century. How do we get past the, uh, you know, I think you hit one of the things, one of the nails on the head when you said that the incentive for you to do something is not very powerful because yeah. the benefits are global. They're over a long period of time. Yeah. Um, how does Joe the plumber, <laughs> to no. an expression, and, and it, one, how does he care about this? So stuff? one simple answer is we have not solved problems in the past like this by individual action. So although I really did renovate my house, and part of the reasons I hope that will have a big leverage by influencing other people to do theirs, the bottom line is we've solved lots of environmental problems in the last 30 years in the, at least the rich world, ranging from, I mean, solved is too strong, but we made huge strides forward in air and water pollution, on lead and gasoline, on mercury, on, on global ozone. In none of those cases was it done by individual consumer action. In every case, in the end, what had to happen was regulation. It simply is not credible that we're going to solve a problem of this magnitude by individual action. That's not to say individual action isn't important, because it shows politicians that people care about the issue. But fundamentally, this will not be solved by Joe the Plumber making some individual decision to make his house better. It will be solved by Joe the Plumber voting for somebody who regulates. Well, we just voted here in Canada, and they just voted in the U.S. Um, I think the landscape is, some would argue, changed somewhat. What are we looking at now? You know, I've been working on the climate problem now for 20 years, and I don't actually think that all that much changed. I think we have much more attention to climate change than we did a decade ago, and that's very exciting but we're still really in the phase of talking about this, not acting. Over the last 10 or 15 years, we've negotiated a bunch of global agreements, uh, like the UN Convention or, or Kyoto. And during the time we negotiated all those agreements, the rate of growth of carbon emissions, the thing that's driving the problem, went from 1% a year to 3% a year. So carbon tax, cap and trade, how do we do that? How do we get the pricing? <clears throat> Personally, I favor something like a revenue neutral carbon tax, but I think cap and trade could work fine as well. I think the reason you want some mechanism like that is because it doesn't pick winners. It allows people, individuals or companies, to innovate and figure out the cheapest way to cut emissions. That's why those systems are better than systems that say, thou shalt install technology such and such, or even thou shalt install CCS, because we might find things that are a lot better than CCS. So the reason to have economy-wide prices is because they incent innovation. I don't think that's all that's necessary. I also think we need a real push on energy R&D. Right now, uh, uh, energy R&D is uh, much lower than it is in many other industrial sectors, and Canada has a relatively tiny energy R&D in proportion to its energy production, and I think we really need to find ways to improve it, because in the end, to solve this problem requires enormous innovation in the way we make and transform our energy sources.